Good day and welcome to this edition of View on Africa, hosted by the Institute for Security Studies. My name is Gareth Newham and I head the Justice and Violence Prevention Program based in Pretoria, South Africa. Today I'll be talking about the National Prosecuting Authority. What next? Most of us know that recently the Constitutional Court overturned or upheld an, um, a ruling by the High Court that said that the appointment of the most recent National Director of Public Prosecutions, Advocate Sean Abrams, was illegal because of the manner in which his predecessor had been removed or had allowed himself to be removed. This now opens the way for the President, Cyril Ramaphosa, to appoint a new National Director of Public Prosecutor. Uh, of course, this is a first step, or could be a very first step, in something that or a process that should enable the NPA to start rebuilding its trust in the public of South Africa. For too long now, there has been a situation in which, due to political meddling, many South Africans, many people have started to lose faith in what is probably the most important institution in the criminal justice system. The National Prosecuting Authority is the organization that decides whether or not it will proceed with prosecutions against people where there is evidence of criminal conduct. So it really is at the apex or at the heart of the rule of law in our country. But since democracy, not one of our national director of public prosecutions has finished his or her term of office. And in fact, including our current acting national director of uh, public prosecutions, we've had 10 different people occupy that post in that time. So really the person that is appointed will be, uh, have a lot of eyes on them and they'll have a critical role to play. But this is just the first step. They will have to be a person of immense integrity and independence and seen by the public to be so. And that recognition or that trust will have to be earned by the way that they present themselves in public, how they run the organization, and by the various decisions that they have to take in that position. One of the key issues really is about how should that post be appointed? Currently, the Constitution really provides the president with a carte blanche. Apart from choosing somebody who is an advocate and can practice in the high courts or in the courts of South Africa, and should be a person of conscientiousness and uh, skills and ability, there are no real clear criteria or constraints on the president. So many are starting to argue that perhaps a different process should be undertaken from which the president can choose the best possible woman or man to occupy that post. This doesn't necessarily have to be an amendment to the Constitution. It could be something that is amended to the National Prosecuting Authority Act, really, which says that this is a process by which an, an NDPP applicant should be chosen, and then a, a number of them, three or five people, could be presented to the president from which he appoints one. But when that person is appointed, they're going to be faced with a number of challenges. The National Prosecuting Authority, for example, has really been struggling with its budget and capacity constraints in recent years. It, about 10 years ago, it was receiving budgets well in excess of the national or annual inflation rate. But over the last few years, the budget of the NPA has reduced in real terms. This means, according to a presentation in Parliament in March this year, that for the current financial year, the, the NPA is facing a 184 million rand shortfall and that in the next three years, this will be more than 450 million rand in what it needs to be able to achieve the objectives it sets itself. It has a shortage of 244 critical posts. In 2015, it closed the Aspirant Prosecutors uh, Program, which is a program designed to promote skills and capacity amongst young prosecutors so they can eventually become public prosecutors steeped in the code of conduct and the professional ethos that we expect from them. Our research at, uh, at, uh, within certain courts has shown that this decline in the budget and this uh, situation in which many prosecutors are leaving the NPA for other posts, we heard that uh, in last year 70 have left to become magistrates, but a lot more, greater number than that have actually left in the last few years, are not being, refill, are not being filled. Therefore, for the reality for a prosecutor in a court, particularly in the busy district courts, they're expected to do more and more every year, handle more and more cases. And of course, this puts a, a huge burden on them. It undermines their morale. And in many ways, it means that potentially many cases are not properly prepared for. 
And when people see cases being lost or not progressing, they feel that uh, they need some kind of explanation. And often that explanation is not forthcoming. So one of the first key issues that the new NDPP will have to deal with is how to ensure that the NPA improves both its efficiency and if possible, in the numbers of prosecutors that, is, that it has at its, its disposal. And of course, to ensure that it tries to build capacity or at least bring back some of the capacity that it has lost in the recent years where people have left the organization due to what's often been seen as political leader, uh, issues of leadership, uh, leadership challenges that has been besetting the organization. So that is going to be the first port of call. And then they'll have to look at really what is happening with caseloads and what is happening across the courts. Then the, national, the most recent annual report shows that criminal courts really only sit for just over three hours a day. What can be done to increase the numbers of hours that the courts sit for so that more cases can be disposed of? There's also the issue of working with the detective services. Last year, the district courts received about 777,000 cases before them but could only or only chose to institute prosecutions in 91,000 cases, about 11%. About 450,000 cases were rejected. Despite the detectives thinking there was enough evidence, prosecutors did not believe that to be the case. And about another 200 or 230 odd thousand cases were referred back to detectives uh, for further investigation. But of course, the victims, their families, the people are in court watching this happening, not seeing cases progress or seeing cases take a very long time as they are referred back for investigation, has an impact on the way the public see the NPA and its work. That it raises the issue again of accountability. It's not good enough just that the, the, the NPA really does uh, say improve its performance figures. And certainly in the last financial year, in many ways, the NPA has started to finalize more cases. It's in, in virtually all courts, the high courts and district courts, uh, the conviction rate increased um, and more convictions were achieved. So statistically, it is looking good. But those are still the minority of cases that people expect to see processed by the NPA. So the ISS has done work on this before, back in 2014, where the, currently the NPA really uh, is accountable, of course, to Parliament, the Portfolio uh, uh, Committee on Justice and Correctional Services. It is accountable to the Treasury and accountable to the Auditor General. But there's no specific agency steeped in the work of prosecutions that can independently assess what it is doing or, when it decides not to prosecute, review those decisions. And these are various models that should be considered for improving public accountability, which would only serve to strengthen people's understanding of the challenges facing the NPA and the decisions that they take. The Crown Prosecution Service, for instance, has a Crown Prosecution Service Inspectorate, which independently using expertise looks at the efficiencies and the performance of the Crown Prosecution Service every year and identifies bottlenecks and shortcomings that can be addressed by the management of that prosecuting agency uh, the following year and makes these reports publicly available so people can see what is being done to improve efficiencies and that the money allocated to this agency is properly, being properly used. In South Africa, when the NPA chooses to prosecute, of course, the courts are the final arbitrator. So if prosecutions are undertaken for malicious reasons or for political reasons, it will be up to the courts to determine whether there really is indeed enough evidence for such a case to have gone ahead. But of course, if there's a malicious prosecution, it can take many years before a person is finally uh, has a case withdrawn against them, and that can be hugely onerous on those uh, people facing such prosecutions. But when the NPA decides not to prosecute, it very rarely gives reasons in public as to why not. It will simply say, we did not see enough evidence, or we did not believe we had sufficient grounds for uh, achieving a conviction. However, uh, in some cases, the NPA has reviewed that decision and gone ahead with prosecutions. And of course, when that happens, that makes the public think that the initial decision wasn't taken on its merits and before the law, uh, on basis and before the law, and that raises questions. In order to ensure that the public really understands why cases do not proceed, it would be also useful, for example, to set up such an agency. There's one, for example, in Japan, uh, where if people are not happy with decisions not to prosecute, then people can go to that agency and its job is to oversee or review the decisions and explain why the decision was taken. In most cases, it upholds the decisions of the prosecutors, but at least provides the public with a detailed account as to why the decision was taken and serves to build credibility in the institution. 
So when we're moving forward, we need to think about ways in which really we can prove public legitimacy and public trust in this very important institution. Um, and as I said before, that's going to really be looking at how to ensure that their, efficiency, their improvement in efficiencies, that it can deal with greater caseloads, um, and that it builds and retains capacity, particularly in key areas. And I think what we are seeing now, of course, uh, are the, the situation in which there are large numbers of public related corruption cases will be coming before the NPA, and some of them very qu quite involving quite co complex commercial situations. The NPA has, over the last three years, improved its ability to tackle corruption in the public service. For example, three years ago, uh, it only convicted 90 people, but in the most recent financial year, well over 200. So certainly there has been improvements. But in a briefing before Parliament in March of this year, uh, the NPA said it was looking at at least eight different state capture related uh, cases involving as much as 50 billion rand. And those might be quite complex in nature. We saw the asset forfeiture unit not succeeding in the Stina Dairy Farm case early this year, where it's uh, attempt to freeze assets that were allegedly used in the Stina Dairy case, where uh, tens of millions of rands were allegedly defrauded from government, failing, and that money um, being ultimately released to the people who are accused of stealing it. So that, once again, uh, highlights potentially problems with capacity. Hopefully, if it is able to identify and seize large amounts of money that has been stolen, and certainly an amount of 50 billion is huge, that Treasury can make some arrangement to ensure that a proportion of that goes back to capacitating the NPA because it will be investing in the capacity of the state to retrieve funds that have been stolen or have been misappropriated. So that is one area that we need to look at. But I think as we move forward, we are standing at a crossroads in South Africa. We now have a, a new president who seems to be a lot more committed to fighting corruption. But we do know that the last 10 years have been pretty negative for the criminal justice system as a whole, including the NPA. If you look at the period of time, for example, between 2006 and 2016, the number of cases finalized by the NPA dropped by about 70,000 in, in, in the most recent, uh, uh, in that 2016 period. That is quite a dramatic reduction in the workload, despite a period of time where most of the time the budget was above inflation and wasn't really a result of reduction in numbers of uh, prosecutors or capacity. So there is a lot of work to be done, but I think uh, if the NPA has a new head that everybody believes it can do the job, commits him or herself to really uh, working with external role players, improving the, the public image of the NPA, being open, making sure that decisions are taken and clearly understood, uh, promoting accountability in the NPA so if people are not happy with performance they do get feedback on what is happening and make sure that there's a whole new real communication strategy to keep people abreast of what is going on. A lot can be achieved. The NPA really is an institution that is vital to South Africa's criminal justice system, crucial for upholding the, the, the rule of law in South Africa, and all of us would do well to support any efforts that improve it. And certainly um, the many hardworking men and women who currently still exist in the NPA who go to the many courts across the country and work under very difficult conditions, we need to try and see how their lives can be improved so that they really can do the job that they need to do and improve uh, public safety in South Africa.